My name is Angela Brown, and my business is Brown Angel Skin and Hair, a plant-based clean beauty product line that features vintage black actresses on the labels. My business is a micro business, and I was concerned about taking that risk to get this new concept out. The Comcast Rise Grant has given me an opportunity to take that risk and scale up my business and take it to the next level. I feel that my business helps increase representation for black women on the shelf. Reversing Roe v. Wade could reshape the national abortion debate. What comes next for abortion access? We are going to have 36 million women in this country live in the 26 states that are likely to go dark and have no access to abortion care, potentially need abortion care. What will it mean for reproductive rights across the country? This train's only going in one direction for those who want to take away the right to a safe and legal abortion in this country. It's only going one direction, and there, there's no point in fooling yourself about where it's going. On this month's Civic Cocktail, we'll explore the effects of this momentous decision. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Civic Cocktail. I'm your host, Monica Guzman. Almost 50 years ago, the US Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling in Roe versus Wade. By the time many of you watch this on KCTS 9, that same institution is expected to have reversed it. Roe v. Wade established the right to a safe and legal abortion nationwide. Its reversal means that each state in this extraordinarily divided country of ours will need to decide for itself whether to legalize abortions or to ban them. In Washington state, we decided long ago that we will continue letting people get abortions here even if Roe falls. But the impact of this game-changing decision extends far beyond access. What changes for clinics and service providers as demand grows from other states? Will our legislators reinforce our laws as other states rewrite theirs? And finally, what should Washingtonians know about the broader legal implications for our rights going forward? That, and that is a lot, is what we'll unpack tonight with a leading abortion service provider, an invested state legislator in this issue, and our state's top lawyer. So with us to explore the impacts in our clinics and in our capital are my first two guests. So please join me in welcoming Rebecca Gibron, CEO of Planned Parenthood Great Northwest, Hawaii, Alaska, Indiana, and Kentucky, and, and Manka Dingra, Washington State Senator from the 45th District and Chair of the Senate's Law and Justice Committee. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's right, deep breath. We've got a lot to cover. And I wanna start with demand. What's gonna happen with demand for abortion services in our state? So Rebecca, once Roe is struck down, and abortion becomes illegal in many other states, including Idaho, where you live, demand for abortions in Washington is projected to almost quadruple. Can Washington clinics handle the influx of new patients, particularly the three full service abortion clinics east of the Cascades? How are you preparing? Yeah, thanks, Monica. I think that's a great question. And you know, as you point out, the Guttmacher Institute um, has released some data that upwards of 385% increase of people who need and seek abortion care, their first and closest health care center will be in the state of Washington. Right. So I, I think that what we are doing right now is everything possible to undergird our operations, to make sure that we are utilizing telehealth in balance with our bricks and mortar um, services so that we can open access and be ready for what we expect to be an absolute flood of patients mm -hmm. who are in desperate need of abortion care and can't get it in their home state. Mm. And I know that in Boise, uh, Planned Parenthood closed a clinic 
uh, before you know the decision has not come down yet. Why close that clinic early? And then any plans to open new clinics where you can? Yeah, so that's a, it's a really great question. And I think that we have been planning, unfortunately, for this for a very long time. And one of the things that we have to do is look at what, what we think we can anticipate in terms of patient behavior and where they need to go for care. Mm. And what do we know about that? What can we project? Really, we're learning a bit about that out of the state of Texas. And what we're finding are patients are wanting to really preserve their dignity and autonomy and how they're accessing care. They're getting in cars. Mm. They're driving to states where they might have friends or family members. Um, and they're really looking mm. far and wide for the first ava available health care center mm. where they can get the care that they have a right to receive. Mm. So, Manka, Planned Parenthood, of course, is a nationwide service provider. As a legislator here in Washington, you're elected to serve the people of Washington. So, so here's sort of a, a philosophical question, I suppose. Given this post row landscape, does this state have an obligation to people from Idaho, Montana, or other states who would come to us for service? And if so, how far does that obligation go, do you think? You know, I just want to say it just feels so surreal to be having this conversation mm -hmm. at this time. Mm -hmm. um, I just can't believe we're here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I do want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we absolutely have a duty to help others. We do that from refugees from other countries. You mm -hmm. know, with Afghanistan, we set up an Afghani refugee fund. When, um, so we do that for people across the world. And now we are looking at doing it for Americans. We are mm -hmm. looking to doing it for women. That's where we are. Who are Americans who mm -hmm. need to come to the state to access care, which to me is actually shocking. Mm -hmm. But I'm really fortunate that we are living in a state where we can provide those services. But mm -hmm. many of us are very committed to making sure that we are a safe haven for others in America. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you interpret then that, that sense of, of a duty or obligation in your work? So multiple ways, right? One is making sure when we have mostly women individuals coming into our state that uh, we have some kind of services set up where hopefully we can set up some kind of um, scholarship or grants or funding mm. so that they can access services. Mm. The other thing that we're very, very concerned about is liability protection. Liability protection for our providers that if they are um, performing mm. medically necessary, very appropriate medical care. To folks from out of state. From out of state. Our providers, yeah. So they're not held liable in other states. Um, we really are very concerned mm -hmm. about criminal charges that uh, other states may want to uh, utilize mm -hmm. for uh, the providers or even for the individuals seeking care. So really making sure we're trying to um, deal with liability issues as mm -hmm. well as you know malpractice insurance, making sure we have the doctors mm -hmm. doing this necessary work. I think the state of Oregon has set aside something like $15 million to help uh, people from out of state coming in to receive care. Is that something you'd like to see Washington emulate? We're taking a look at what the numbers look like. Mm -hmm. I am really not sure what these numbers will be. Mm -hmm. um, and we all know that if we have more conversations about consensual sex, about reproductive um, health, that the need for abortions goes down because you can provide uh, information so that our uh, individuals can make smart decisions. And unfortunately, a lot of the states where you're seeing these rights go away. You're also seeing a corresponding decrease in education and access to contraceptive services. Mm -hmm. So it's really unclear to me what the need is going to be. Mm, yep, this is a big issue that extends uh, pretty, pretty far. So staying with you, Manka, you voted for a bill in March here in, in, this, in Washington that affirms a person's right to choose or refuse an abortion in our state. Another new Washington law shields people who choose abortion or anyone who helps them from being sued, uh, as you mentioned, and allows more medical professionals as well to perform abortions. What else do you think our legislator sh legislature should do uh, if the goal is to provide services to more women? So, so you mentioned um, shielding providers. You're worried about liability. Um, you know, we, we talked about the, the money set aside. Who knows? Is there anything else that's on that list? You know, I think we also have to take a look at scope of practice for other medical providers to see whether they're mm. in a position to be 
performing or guiding individuals um, to help them make their decisions. What do you mean by scope of practice? So, you know, we have medical assistants, we have a lot of different individuals in our medical field. Mm -hmm. And so really taking a look at, you know, is there uh, other things that they can be doing? Mm -hmm. I know we talk a lot about uh, prescription medication that can be also mailed to other individuals right. in the state, taking mm -hmm. a look and seeing uh, what that looks like, taking a look and seeing if we have, again, someone else who can walk a patient through the conversation mm -hmm. of what a uh, prescription medication would do, what the consequences would be. And, and you mean a prescription medication that would induce cause abortion. induced abortion? Absolutely. Okay. So I think we're taking a look at that entire um, spectrum to see uh, what we can do and where we need to um, either close loopholes or be clear on um, the scope of practice for those individuals. Gotcha. So moving to the deepening divide, uh, the divide that is clearly not going away. Rebecca, you lead Planned Parenthood in six states, uh, three of which are expected to effectively ban abortion mm -hmm. once Roe is overturned. Um, Indiana, Kentucky, and Idaho, where, where you live and is our neighboring state. According to data from the Public Religion Research Institute, 61% of Washingtonians think abortion should be legal in most or all cases, but only 41% of people in Idaho do. So as an abortion service provider and advocate, what do you feel that you must do and say differently in Idaho than you do here? You know, I, I don't know that it's about saying anything differently. I, I fundamentally believe Every family has an abortion story. They just may not know about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is about telling our stories. It's about, you know, this, removing the stigma mm -hmm. of abortion care in this country, um, in these states that are going to go dark. I mean, we're facing a public health crisis. We are going to have 36 million women in this country live in the 26 states that are likely to go dark and have no access to abortion care, potentially need abortion care. And so I think we have to keep talking about abortion as vital health care mm -hmm. that people need. Mm -hmm. And that when you think of the statistics, one in four women in this country have had an abortion. So I, we have to have our voices heard. We have to keep raising these issues mm -hmm. and talking about how it impacts all families. And how, you know, when you, run, when you are in Kentucky, Indiana, Idaho, obviously it's, it's, a, it's a less friendly environment to that conversation. So knowing what we know, that, that this conversation has not penetrated all that far in 50 years of Roe v. Wade, how do you want to change, how do you want to see that argument change, given that most states in this country are going to ban abortion? I think it's just what I've what I've been talking about. We have to keep talking about our stories and listen, everybody deserves the right to make private medical decisions without lawmaker interference. We all should have the right to bodily autonomy and privacy in our medical decisions mm -hmm. with our medical providers, with our families. We do not need lawmakers telling us what we can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And we're in, this, we're in this unprecedented moment where we're being kicked mm -hmm. out of the Constitution. We have lived with Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. as the law of the land mm -hmm. for 50 years. And we are facing this unprecedented, horrible moment in time mm -hmm. that is going to reverse our right to bodily autonomy and privacy in our medical decisions. And so I think we have to keep you know, for, for so long, the anti-abortion activists have voted and made this one of their number one issues that they vote on. Mm -hmm. It's time for those of us who believe in the right to safe legal abortion to make this our number one issue that we're voting on. Mm. Okay, and we'll come back to, uh, yeah, <laughs> more on that in a moment. Manka, the, the people I know and love who want to see Roe v. Wade overturned, believe that many abortions harm human life to an intolerable degree. As a state legislator working to expand abortion access, do you see a way to bridge the divide between abortion opponents and advocates? So to me, this is about choice. 
no one is saying, I advocate that everyone should go get an abortion. Mm -hmm. What we are saying is a woman has a right to discuss her health needs with her doctor with no one else interfering in that decision. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is a healthcare decision. It is also an economic decision. We've seen this all across the world when you have had other countries and women have finally gotten that right to make, uh, have control over their bodies, it has helped them financially. So it's not just healthcare, it's a financial decision as well. And when you talk with folks who disagree, right. is that, <clears throat> Is that connecting? That it, you know, that is a harder connection to make. Right. I think the the one that I know that I have um, spent uh, time actually, this one woman comes to mind talking mm -hmm. about this, where she was not happy about um, my my political stance on abortion, and I said, listen, I would love everyone to not have an abortion, but that means we have to make sure our children get educated on mm -hmm. sex, they get um, access mm -hmm. to contraception, that we are having this conversation about our bodies. And we have seen that, is mm -hmm. when you have those conversations and provide those access to contraception, the demand for abortions goes down. Mm -hmm. And so if the end goal is to reduce abortions, we have to teach our children comprehensive sex ed. We mm -hmm. have to make contraception available, and you will see that happening. But at the end of the day, you cannot interfere between a woman's decision mm -hmm. over her body and the doctor um, that she is meeting to get that um, procedure done. That is not simply a place that a state needs to get involved with. But I think there is some places where we can share if we can say, yes, our, both our goals is to mm. reduce abortion, mm. but let's do it through these me methods. Mm -hmm. the problem so maybe be that's a starting point. Well, it's a starting point, okay. but in a lot of these individuals do not want to talk about comprehensive sex ed. So, they so, yeah, don't want to more. talk about free contraception. and so. You know, if you want to reduce abortions, we know that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. But if they're not even coming to meet us and saying, let's educate mm -hmm. our children, let's provide uh, free contraception, it's very hard to get to that reduction in abortions. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca, do you, uh, what have you learned from the apparent success of, the, uh, of abortion opponents? Well, listen, when, when Roe v. Wade was decided back in 1973, abortion opponents said they had a 45 to 50 year plan to overturn it. Well, guess what? We will too. And we've got to fight. We've got to fight mm -hmm. forward. Um, I think that the, the thing that is so stark to me is that medical voices mm -hmm. and women's voices have been drowned out by politicians who want to be in the bedroom. They want to be in the exam room and they're not listening to medical professionals you know the the ultra conservative anti-abortion voices are really taking you know have a stronghold um you know on this country on uh, politicians right now mm -hmm. and i think we have to fight back and we have to fight hard um you know we have to have the, the kind of resolve. And now's the, the time we have to galvanize every supporter, every voice, every patient, every person who cares about this issue mm -hmm. has got to lean in on this moment in time. So a, a reader question, uh, a viewer question coming in based on something we just talked about. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, what do you think will be the impact on the availability of birth control and education? Uh, do you see that? I mean, you, you were saying that it might be a starting point to say, well, it seems like all sides want to reduce abortions. Okay, we can begin there. Uh, are, are you afraid that that would be a, a difficult path? Yeah, I'll give you a great example. In the state of Idaho, where I live, um, on the very same day that our legislature was passing a six-week abortion ban, they also refused to pass a bill that would expand access to birth control. Mm -hmm. mm. So this is, this is fundamentally about power and control. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, if we do want to, to reduce abortion in this country, to the Senator's point, we have to provide comprehensive sex ed. We know that teens who receive comprehensive sex ed delay sexual activity for a full 18 months longer than teens who receive no contracept, uh, comprehensive sex ed. So if, if the goal is to reduce abortion, 
then states should be leaning into providing mm -hmm. state-funded family planning care, comprehensive sex education, mm -hmm. expanding access to birth control, not, not turning their backs. Mm -hmm. So let's move to, <laughs> uh, like, we have, like we said right at the beginning, here in Washington State, no matter what happens with Roe v. Wade, uh, uh, we allow abortions. This was a 1991 law. Uh, that was voted on by the public, and, and here we are. So this year, Manka, um, we affirmed that, that right to abortion here in the state. So, so yeah, striking down Roe was never gonna, was never gonna impact this way, but what many people don't know is that that 1991 public vote squeaked by 50.04% is what is what uh, you know, it, it encoded, I suppose, Roe v. Wade in our state. So given that laws can change and attitudes can change, from a legislative perspective, what do you think are the most likely ways, despite the laws in the books today, that access to abortion here in Washington state could be threatened in the future? So I greatly worry about hospital mergers. This is something that um, other legislators and I have been worried about for the last four or five years. And last year, with the merger of um, Shea Franciscan with uh, Virginia Mason, mm -hmm. it was again brought to the forefront. And then it was Swedish with Providence in 2012. Right? Correct. And so when we take a look at, you know, we have great laws on the books, but they're meaningless if there are no providers. Mm -hmm. And so in the state of Washington, about half, maybe even more, of our hospital beds are faith-based beds. Mm -hmm. And we had a bill last session that talked about oversight over hospital mergers specifically to make sure mm -hmm. that uh, regardless of the mergers, you don't have a reduction in access to reproductive health, uh, end of life, and gender affirming care. Mm -hmm. And that bill did not pass, right. but we are working on it. I hope, uh, I know the bill will be back next session. Mm -hmm. and why, hope, why didn't it pass? You know, this was a last, uh, a short session. The bill was dropped late, mm -hmm. and it was, hadn't worked out all the kinks in it. Okay. There were some concerns on the length of delay on it. So mm -hmm. there's definitely a path forward for it. It just needed a little bit more work. Mm -hmm. But we have to make sure that regardless of what our laws say, that access mm -hmm. is fundamental. And if mm -hmm. people can't get the care they need when they need it, it doesn't matter what our laws say. Mm -hmm. Any other concerns other than the uh, faith-based hospitals? Well, we want to make sure that it is accessible all across the state. Uh, I think you had mentioned we only have three providers east of the mountain. Right. And that is, again, an issue we have to take a look at in uh, you know, urban-rural areas. Liability is, again, something I really worry about. Mm -hmm. um, I also well, now that we have the law, so help me understand, because we just passed that law saying, no, you can't sue providers or anyone helping someone get an abortion here. So. Why should we still worry? I still worry about insurance companies and uh, personal providers, how much they're charged for the work that they do, whether if okay. they're a pediatrician or they're an OBGYN. Um, and I think there's a, that's, that discrepancy there. I also want to make sure that we're having really good conversations with our medical board in making sure doctors aren't uh, held to a different standard if mm -hmm. they are performing these procedures. And I greatly worry about our medical schools and their lack of mm -hmm. teaching on uh, abortion care. Oh, I do have a few cousins who are medical doctors and I've often asked them, did you learn this procedure? And mm -hmm. they haven't. Yeah. And so, you know, if you want to preserve this right moving forward, you actually have to have providers who know how to perform this procedure. Mm -hmm. And so I worry about um, our medical schools really not training our next generation of OBGYNs. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Rebecca, though, though six in 10 Americans uh, do believe that abortion should be legal in, in most or all cases, the issue is, of course, complicated. The passions, as you know, are very strong, and the political stakes might be at an all-time high. So given that, what is your strategy uh, as we approach elections in November? Yeah, here's what we know. We know that 80% of Americans in this country believe abortion should be safe and legal. Only 30% of Americans actually think that Roe v. Wade will be overturned. Now that needle has moved after the leak. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I think, I was say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the needle's moved point. now after the, after, the, after the leaked document came out. Mm -hmm. But I think that, as I was saying earlier, we have to make this a single issue voting. You know, if you're, if you're not a single issue voter and this issue is important to you, now's the time. Mm 
to be a single issue voter mm -hmm. on reproductive health and abortion care. Mm -hmm. Because for 45 years, 50 years, the anti-abortion movement has utilized anti-abortion goals as their single issue for voting. We've got to get in this fight because we know 80% of American public believe in the right to safe and legal abortion, but we've got to have our voices heard. People need to start talking about this. It, it kind of comes back, I guess, to the question about bridging the divide from before. Mm -hmm. um, because what we have now is sort of a 50 state brawl, right? With half the states this way, half the states that way. Mm -hmm. And so are, are you saying that, well, we have to just dig down it's and defend? It's dig down. It's, that's that's, it's, that's we, what you we think have is no, happening? We have no choice. We have people all across this country relying on us to provide health care to them and to fight for their right mm -hmm. to access safe and legal abortion. We have to start telling our stories. One in four women in this country has had an abortion. We all know someone mm -hmm. who's had an abortion, whether they're talking about it or whether they feel safe enough to talk about it is the issue. We have to have our voices mm -hmm. heard. Every voice matters in this moment and in this fight for this vital healthcare right. Mm -hmm. So I wanna to turn to some uh, reader questions. So I keep saying reader. Viewer, viewer questions. Um, how can we work toward holding the men who father the children accountable? <laughs> you know, we've been talking I, about women, mostly women, right? What, what's so that about? I have been thinking about this a lot <laughs> because when I hear the rhetoric from other states where they really care about the child, my question has been, <laughs> Are you then doing automatic parentage where the sperm donor is listed um, mm. and is responsible for medical care, for child care? Mm. Are we doing providing um, health benefits for women when they need to take time off from work? Are we doing um, you know, uh, child support payments automatically? Mm. You don't hear any of that. And so to me, this is, you know, this is, it has nothing to do with taking care of the child. Mm -hmm. It goes back to something you said about power and control. Mm -hmm. It is about the ability to control the female body. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. If it was anything other than that, you would see a whole list of other laws about comprehensive sex ed, about contraception, mm -hmm. about child support, about child care, about health care because that's how you take care of a child, mm -hmm. is you provide those services. But we hear nothing about it. All we hear about is control over the female body. Mm -hmm. Another question, how would making Washington a, a sanctuary state for abortion be decided? So maybe we can explain that. Seems prudent, this viewer says, to bring it to a vote to the people. Well, I think that Washingtonians have spoken loud and clear. Mm -hmm. um, we believe in a woman's right to choose. We believe in full reproductive health. And we are going to do everything we can to make sure every Washingtonian, regardless of where they live, have access to that service. And that's what we were working on in the legislature prior to the Roe versus Wade decision. We're going to continue to do so. And uh, the same thing for other women in our country. If they need help, Washington will be that state that provides that help. So uh, there's lots of concerns about other rights that may be in jeopardy because of the, the precedent that is being reversed. So, so talk to us about, about that, uh, gender care, mm -hmm. other kinds of treatment, LGBTQ. Listen, the, the anti-abortion activists, the conservative right, has been emboldened by this moment. They're now saying the quiet things out loud so what do you mean by that? They're, they're being very vocal and very bold that they're plan, they plan to go after birth control. Mm -hmm. We have a few states across this country that are trying to, that are talking about bringing bills next legislative session to ban birth control. And they're not just hiding. Couple, do you know which states? Idaho's Idaho a great Idaho one. one. Okay. Yes, we have a legislator in Idaho who said he wanted to bring a bill next mm -hmm. year to ban IUDs. Mm -hmm. What's next? They're going to go after gender-affirming hormone care. They're going to go after same-sex marriage. And just to be clear, has anyone gone after it yet? Not yet, right? 
I just want to like, has anyone said this is what I'm going to do next? next yes, week? there okay. have been congressional okay. leaders okay. who have said they are planning to go after more of these fundamental rights across the country. Do you have anything to add? I, I agree with that. I really worry about same-sex marriages. I worry about uh, gender-affirming care. I'm greatly concerned about what's going on with the LGBTQ plus communities in mm -hmm. states like Texas and Florida. Mm -hmm. I mean, the writing is on the wall and has been for a while. I just really hope people pay attention, pay more attention, and do become single um, issue voters because that is what this moment needs. And if there's any doubt that this is not about power and control, the state of Missouri is trying to pass a mm -hmm. law mm -hmm. that would make it illegal for anyone to leave the state right. to get an abortion. Yeah. It's, it's lawsuits against people who even would drive someone, right? Yes. Um, yeah, and that's, that's a proposal, but mm -hmm. there it is. But, but they're opening the playbook, right. right? I mean, they're no longer having these conversations and closed doors. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by saying the quiet things okay. out loud now. Okay. And I'll just like to add that you mentioned the two <coughs> bills we passed mm -hmm. this last session. Yes. Even on those bills, we had Republican amendments that were trying to put on um, things that um, Florida and uh, Texas are doing in terms of actually holding people liable for helping right. individuals get abortion. So this is not something that's happening in other states. Mm -hmm. We're still fighting those issues in Washington as well. Okay. Well, uh, there it is. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, thank Senator you for Dingra, for sharing your insights on such a charged topic in, in such a charged time. And thanks to all of you um, watching remotely and our live audience here in Town Hall Seattle. We're going to take a quick break and be back soon for the second part of reversing Roe versus Wade with uh, Washington Attorney General Bob Ferguson. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Civic Cocktail. In the first segment of tonight's program, we looked at the impact that removing a national right to, an, to abortion will have through the eyes of a Washington legislator and a leading service provider. Now, we're going to explore the effect of what is technically a legal decision with the help of our state's chief legal officer. Please help me welcome to the program a fourth generation Washingtonian serving his 10th year as Washington State Attorney General Bob Ferguson. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> so once Roe v. Wade is overturned, as everyone expects it will, every state will set its own rules around abortion access. Our state already set those rules. We're keeping abortion, done, yay. <laughs> And yet, your office has earned quite the reputation for strong national advocacy. You sued the Trump administration a lot when you thought its policies were hurting Washingtonians, um, winning 50 out of 52 cases, quite the record. And you've called the Supreme Court's apparent reversal um, of, of the right to an abortion deeply alarming. So given all of that, how has how has your office been preparing for this moment? Yeah, thanks, Monica. Thanks, everybody, for being here. It's great to see you all. And uh, yeah, first, I'll just say the, the decision, if it comes out the way it's been drafted, uh, yeah. you know, it's not just alarming, deeply alarming. It's, it's radical. It's extreme. It overturns decades of precedent. I mean, it's from a legal perspective. It's from, it's a, about, legal from a legal perspective. perspective it's, extreme. it's as extreme okay. as it gets. Um, in terms of how our office is preparing, I, I guess a couple of things I'd say, Monica. One is that I, I wasn't shocked to see the draft. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and that the court may be taking this action. So frankly, in our office, I'm a big believer in being prepared uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, in the work we do on behalf of the people, to be prepared for things that might come uh, that we have to be prepared for. And mm -hmm. Donald Trump becoming president was one of those. We spent the time leading up to his presidency getting ready for a Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Similar here, we're anticipating, hey, there could be an opinion that rolls back protections for women in this country. We put together a team of, you know, give or take about 20 people who, who are involved in preparing for potential scenarios mm -hmm. that this opinion, if it comes out, mm -hmm. could have implications for providers, for women here, for individuals who come to our state seeking abortion, you name mm -hmm. it. There's a lot of potential legal issues. Mm -hmm. So we've been spending a lot of time 
preparing for this. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you sent a letter, right, to Congress. Was that one of the moves? Yeah, and that's another move as well, mm -hmm. that um, at, at different levels, I'm not a policy maker per se, right? right? That's why we have our congressional representatives. But I did lead a coalition of state AGs expressing to Congress, mm -hmm. hey, some actions they can take, for example, to ensure that women have ac access to uh, birth control through pills, for example, mm -hmm. through the U.S. mails, and ensuring that that is a right for all women in our country. So there are steps that Congress can take but I will say primarily our focus, my focus, mm -hmm. my team's focus has been on the legal side, the potential legal ramifications, mm -hmm. and, and just making sure we are ready from day one as much as we can be. Mm -hmm. So I wanna talk about the, the, the national dynamic, uh, the, the landscape that's sort of taking shape in front of us, because right. it's a new one, to say the least. Uh, we're a nation, obviously, with enormous cultural diversity across these 50 states. Nearly three quarters of people in Vermont believe abortion should be legal in most or all cases, while just over a third of people in Louisiana do, mm -hmm. right? So here's a philosophical question for you. Why shouldn't the law be different in states where the attitudes are different? Well, if that's the case, should our laws be different on whether you can have uh, people of different ethnicities get married, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether people who are of the same gender can get married. Pick your constitutional right, right? Mm -hmm. We don't leave core constitutional rights mm -hmm. up to the states to decide. But, that's not but, how, right? that's not how it works. So but when, when so many people don't believe it ought to be a constitutional right, what then becomes the, what's the strategy? That, we, here we are with that, this sort of. That's no different than same-sex marriage, right. right? It's deeply divided, especially at the time, still is, but right. especially at the time when the courts, look, the people, right, hey, the, the politicians in the courts, but you pick your issue, integrating the schools in our country mm -hmm. was deeply divisive at the time it happened. Right. And you pick the issue, that's the nature of why you have courts, right? Why we're a nation of laws, right? Mm -hmm. And the rule of law is because you have courts who determine what rights you have, even if that's a, you're in a minority mm -hmm. position, right? Mm -hmm. Though those rights are sacred to us a, as a people. And so what's unusual here, again, assuming the Supreme Court mm -hmm. does what it looks like they're gonna do, mm -hmm. is the rolling back a right. Right. And that is what is so unusual, is the court to roll back a right mm -hmm. that's ingrained in our Constitution and the right to privacy, of which so many other rights derive from that right to mm -hmm. privacy, by the way. And once you roll that back, that has implications not just for mm -hmm. women's reproductive rights, which are profound, but for other rights that, that we frankly take for granted as well. So given all of that, I mean, what, what do you make of the fact that the, the leading court of the land has decided to go back 50 years and say, never mind, this was a bad idea? And they have a legal, they're, they're making a legal case, right? They're saying this should have never been yeah. our decision to begin with. This should have gone to the states all along. What do you, what do you make of that? Well, it's, I mean, what do I make of it? It's, uh, it's you know, it's ironic, right, that, uh, that sort of conservatives often sort of accuse liberal justice of being activists, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of the, the tag. It doesn't get any more activists than rolling back five decades of precedent mm -hmm. on something as fundamental Right, as reproductive rights, we're talking about a pretty core right that individuals, women enjoy in our mm -hmm. country, and to roll that back, why? Because there's a different makeup of the U.S. Supreme Court. Nothing's mm -hmm. happened, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing's happened since that time. Uh, it's just a new makeup of the court. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so what I make of that is simply that, a new makeup of the court, and as a result, a key right is potentially being rolled back, mm -hmm. and I worry about what that means for other rights as well. Right, and we'll get to that okay. for sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's going out there, as I, I think I mentioned, it really does feel like a, okay, a 50 state legal brawl. And it, it seems to just keep escalating. Um, you've got state laws set to ban abortions. Mm -hmm. You've got state laws and proposals to help people from other states get abortions anyway. Then you've got state laws trying to criminalize out of state abortions and so on. So you've said that your job is to defend and enforce Washington state law. How do you play defense against states that don't want us applying our law to their residents? Yeah, I mean, what? What does that even mean? Yeah, well, what, what, it, what, it, what it means is, is, well, a few things, I guess. But, but number one, it's anticipating what those laws might look like from other states, mm -hmm. number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, not being naive about what leaders in those states or prosecutors in those states might do. 
Mm, say okay. more about that. What well, do you mean not being naive? So, so, so let's, uh, yeah. today, I think I just read in the news today, a West Virginia legislator was sentenced for his role in the insurrection on January 6th. Mm -hmm. An elected official mm -hmm. in West Virginia was sentenced today for his role in that. Mm -hmm. If you told me five years ago that there'd be an insurrection mm -hmm. and elected officials would be a part of it, I'd be like, come on, this is America, right? And so this is America. I, I say then that this is not a time to be naive about yeah. what's going on or what individuals in some deep red states might try to do mm -hmm. to rights that we enjoy here in Washington state or the ability of women to come <laughs> from their state to our state to have a safe and legal abortion. So mm -hmm. part of that preparation is not taking anything for granted. From my, what I tell my team is, in some ways, not dissimilar from the Trump administration years. Just prepare for the worst, mm. right? Prepare for the worst, because I think that's just the best. A good lawyer does that, right? My client is all of you, right? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and so a good lawyer <laughs> tries to anticipate problems and worst case scenarios and get ready for those. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it never comes to that, but honestly, I, I just think you'll see in multiple states to call them extreme is an understatement, but extreme proposals potentially in being adopted by those states mm -hmm. in which they would try to reach into Washington state and have impacts on Washingtonians. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of creativity, I guess, is mm -hmm. one generous way to put it with these laws, the Texas law and others. Is this gonna take some creativity in response? I mean, I'm thinking again of you know, states saying, we don't want our residents to go to another state to do something we have decided is wrong. So how, how do you begin to even answer that legally, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, some of these questions are, um, are ones of what we call sort of first impression, right? That are a little bit unusual. Others are more basic, right? The sovereignty of a state like Washington, right? Jurisdiction from another state to come into Washington right, and right. get jurisdiction over individual We normally provider. don't think about that. Exactly, <laughs> normally there's a lot of protections for the yeah. residents here. And so I wanna be clear, well, I think there are potentially extreme proposals and even legislation that will be adopted by those states, mm -hmm. I also feel confident that in Washington, we will be able to protect Washingtonians and providers and women who come to our state. I'm not suggesting it's gonna be easy or there won't be challenges or that significant resources will need to be expended to do that, mm -hmm. um, but that's our job and, and that's what we're focused on. So there's been a lot of talk that the next goal for uh, abortion opponents might be a federal yes. ban on abortions. Yes. Um, so that's a, that's a political thing, that's Congress. What do you make of that possibility? Yeah, I think you can take the may out of that question and say it is their next goal. Okay. Like that, that's just, this train's only going in one direction for those who wanna take away the right to a safe and legal abortion in this country. It's only going one direction and there, there's no point in fooling yourself about where it's going. Mm -hmm. You can either get in front of that train, try and stop it or watch it go by. As disastrous as the overturning of Roe v. Wade will be or would be, it can, believe it or not, get even worse, and that is, to your question, hey, does Congress take an action to ban abortion across the United States, mm -hmm. and you have an individual in the White House who signs that into law? Mm -hmm. So the role that would come for me at that point is actually pretty clear, and that is mm -hmm. that it'd be doing everything we could to, in a legal fight that would inevitably ensue, that sort of pits a federal law against a state law, right, mm -hmm. and the clash, and these happen from time to time, and doing everything in our power to uphold the will of the voters who have said we want safe legal abortions here and mm -hmm. actions of our legislature to ensure that that is right here in Washington state up against the federal government that is taking a different position. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is apples and oranges in a certain way, but one way to think about it, right, is take an issue like marijuana legalization, federal government, you have a law making uh, marijuana possession illegal. You have a state like Washington that legalizes it. You have a conflict there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can end up in court. And, right. uh, and so that's what we'd be preparing for if Congress took that extreme step. It is a political question, but hey, you know, elections matter, right? And, and who we elect to these positions will determine that. But I have, there's zero doubt in my mind if Republicans take control of the House and the Senate and a Republican That's is president of the United States. Look, I, I mean, uh, they will stop at nothing to do that. Hmm. I mean, they will stop at nothing and that's how I view it and that's how I communicate to my team to prepare for it. I mean, it's no different than the 2024 election. You know, I communicate to my team for the national election, assume a worst case scenario where uh, folks are trying to overturn the will of the voters in the United States. What can we do to help other states, right? Mm -hmm. Prepare for a worst case scenario. So moving to uh, a conversation about rights yeah. um, and, and beginning here, some states want to lock in their uh, abortion laws, whether they're imminent after Roe mm -hmm. falls or they're already on the books, like for us. It, it, by, by making amendments to their constitutions. Right. Almost like putting, putting the law, putting the preference in a safe, right? You and Governor Inslee have said you'd consider a constitutional amendment to protect abortion rights in Washington state. 
How high a priority is that for you? I'd say for me in my role as Attorney General, mm -hmm. well, I think it is helpful in terms of my list of priorities of what I'm working on every day, that's low on my list. And why is that? I, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not minimizing the importance of it. I want to be clear. It's just mm -hmm. I try to stay focused on what I have some control over. And we're pretty busy with the issues we're talking about already. So mm -hmm. a couple of reasons I would say to it is that, number one, to change our state constitution, adopted in 1889 by design, that is Tough. difficult. You need a two-thirds vote of your state house, a two-thirds vote of your state senate, and then a majority vote of the people of the state. Look, there are not those majorities in the state house or the state senate, and something tells me the 2022 elections here in Washington state are not gonna, are not gonna necessarily increase those majorities right. uh, to get to two thirds. So again, sort of back to the practical side, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure it's, it's practically gonna happen anytime soon, but from a legal standpoint, that's worth mentioning, I think, is that I, I'm not convinced that, that that right in our constitution isn't already there. Our state constitution, mm -hmm. the state constitution give you mm -hmm. greater rights than the US constitution, it can't give you fewer rights, okay? Mm -hmm. And our state constitution, like I said, adopted a lot of years ago, has pretty strong language around privacy. And so that has not been tested in the courts. In other mm -hmm. words, is that already in our state constitution? Mm -hmm. That right to privacy, does that encompass women's reproductive right. rights? So in other words, there's a low likelihood that it could ever be interpreted, our state's constitution, to not already be giving that right. I, I think it's entirely possible that if that issue was ever before our state Supreme Court, uh -huh. that the state Supreme Court would say, look at our constitution, look at the language, and say, hey, you know what? It's there. You don't need this <laughs> constitutional amendment necessarily. So again, I want to be mm -hmm. clear. I'm not minimizing that effort, right, of mm -hmm. folks who are interested in that. But I just think in the short term, I'm not sure how practical it is. Mm -hmm. And number two, um, I think it's entirely possible that right is already in our state constitution. Okay. Your office serves to protect the rights of Washingtonians. To many, fetuses are pre-born children and full Washingtonians already. Mm -hmm. Worthy of protection under the law and of the right to continue existing. So do you believe a fetus has any right to continue existing? And if so, how do you balance it with the rights of the person carrying it? Yeah, I believe that Washington state law has a right when it comes to reproductive rights and the balancing of the interests that are involved in reproductive rights. Okay. And so what I would say is that my job is crystal clear, right? It's to defend and enforce Washington state law. Now, it just so happens that I, I happen to agree with our laws on that, right? But hey, I do that even when I don't agree with the law, okay? We've had a death penalty in our state for many years. I've had to defend and enforce that as an attorney general if I disagree with those laws. I've mm -hmm. sought to change them, but I happen to agree with them. So, you know, from my standpoint, I'm a statewide elected official. I understand mm -hmm. that on many issues that I am mm -hmm. involved in, there are deep divides. Right. I'm imagining I'm, somebody telling you, hey, you know, you're our attorney general. Yes. Why not protect, you know, I believe that, he, that life begins yes. here. Yes. Why, why aren't we protecting the rights of those humans? Yeah. And I would say they're entitled to their view, right? Yeah. But they're not entitled to their interpretation of the law, right? Okay. That our law is crystal clear. The mm -hmm. voters have voted on this, right? They've gone mm -hmm. to the polls, people had their chance, and they voted to ensure that women have a right to a safe and legal abortion. But I would mm -hmm. say that person, if you feel strongly about that, then you need to take action to change the makeup of the legislature, go to the ballot box mm -hmm. with an initiative. With Roe overturned, uh, a lot of people are worried that a federally protected right to an abortion is just the first thing to go. Mm -hmm. and, and this has come up a couple times mm -hmm. tonight. So, so let's, let's talk about this. What, what about the other rights that are affected, effectively protected by Supreme Court rulings? So um, you know, t tell us what those are. What are the ones that feel to you like, okay, we gotta keep an eye out on that. You've been telling your team, yeah. let's, let's figure this out. Yeah, and so, so just take a half step back. So yeah when the court issues their opinion, again, let's assume it's word for word what the draft was, just for the sake of this conversation, uh, the, right? The row reversal. You got right. it, well, let's say it's exactly draft. the okay. same. Yep. So I'm gonna oversimplify terribly on a complex issue, right? Sure. But, but, um, but the, the right that women have enjoyed for decades is grounded in a right to privacy, okay? okay. And so if the court takes this action, they are eroding that right to privacy in the context of reproductive rights. Right. In the context and, of reproductive yes, rights. exactly. Right. Okay. But no Supreme Court opinion operates in a vacuum okay. by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. And there would be language in that opinion where someone who wants to say, wait a second, our right to marry who we choose, same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. is grounded in all sorts of privacy rights. Mm -hmm. Women's right to other forms of birth control is grounded in privacy. Mm -hmm. So again, not to sugarcoat it, but I guarantee you what will happen next there will be okay. challenges on those issues that are deeply personal 
to the individuals in this room and who are mm -hmm. watching and to women. And, and where would those challenges come from? Like organizations, how would this play organizations out? that make it their mission to roll back protections that people enjoy and to fight those. And that's that's just reality, right? I mean, we had a, a case in our office where I filed a lawsuit against a flower shop in the Tri-Cities for not serving flowers to a same-sex couple for their right. wedding when they serve wedding flowers to heterosexual couples. Right. Thankfully, the Supreme Court chose not to take that case, but mm -hmm. there is an organization that funded that whole operation. Mm -hmm. They've got a legal team, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And they look for cases like that mm -hmm. to take up to the courts. Look, an organization like that is gonna come right back after Roe v. Wade is overturned, if that's what happened, mm -hmm. and take language from that opinion, say, mm -hmm. hey, Supreme Court, look what you said about privacy in this context. Well, guess what? It applies in this context as well. If you apply mm -hmm. that same rationale, mm -hmm. that same reasoning, those same principles around privacy, mm -hmm. guess what? other constitutional rights start to erode as well. Mm -hmm. And so... So you see a legal vulnerability. And there, there, I guess the there thing... Is no doubt. The thing that I would observe is there's been a very active, you know, pro-life movement that really hasn't let up for a long time, right? And they've scored a big That's success with this. Yeah. Um, but there isn't exactly, like, a lot of protests saying all over the nation, right, saying down with same-sex marriage. So is that a reason to relax? Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it is, there would be, I mean, I, I cannot express, Monica, the level of vigilance that would be required from residents of our state, right, to, to, to lawyers, to, to, to anyone who cares about these mm -hmm. issues, because, um, look, there may not be protests in, this, in Washington state around, hey, same-sex marriage, but I'll tell you this, they fought that case, mm -hmm. again, on the rights of a man to walk into a flower shop mm -hmm. and buy flowers for his wedding to a same-sex partner. I could walk in that flower shop and buy mm -hmm. flowers for my wife, but he could not for a same-sex partner. Mm -hmm. And they fought that for years, tooth and nail, with significant resources. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it's, it, it doesn't take that much to, <laughs> no. to enter the courts? No, no, no. and when, okay. when you have the resources they have, and look, that's the system, right? I mean, yeah. they're, that's they're how entitled, it works. That's, that's how it works. works. They're entitled to do that, I wanna be clear, but mm -hmm. you know, let's not kid ourselves, Roe v. Wade, as disastrous as it would be overturning it, mm -hmm. it is also the first stop on eroding other constitutional rights, that there will be mm -hmm. groups who try that, and that is, take that to the bank. I, yeah, I, I was gonna say, you seem it. really confident. <laughs> <about> <laughs> <that>. <laughs> look, I, I just don't, you know, uh, look, if you told me five years ago we'd have a president who would say Muslims can't come to the United States, mm. I would say that's crazy. Mm -hmm. If you told me there's gonna be an insurrection of the Capitol, I would say that would be crazy, right? <laughs> Pick your issue, but now it's just every day in the headlines, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just lost my, being naive about these issues a long, long time ago mm -hmm. and just chose to take a different approach. And that mm -hmm. is wake up in the morning, uh, doing everything I can to make sure that the rights of Washingtonians mm -hmm. are protected. <laughs> uh, yeah, th thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Monica. Um, Attorney General yeah, Bob Ferguson. <laughs>Uh, thank you for everyone for being here. Thanks to all of you here with me uh, in, in person in our live audience at Town Hall Seattle. And of course, to all of you participating remotely. This has been quite the conversation at quite the time. Civic Cocktail returns um, in, in about a month uh, when we will focus on arts and music in our region. Oh, I'm sorry, on July 13th, I missed that. Civic Cocktail returns on July 13th when we will focus on arts and music in our region, looking at the health of our creative community with leaders from museums, music festivals, and the Seattle Theater Group. You can find out more at crosscut.com slash events. Thank you everyone for joining us and good night. Thanks,